This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. Welcome to God's Planning. If you like this episode or enjoy it, please think about subscribing to us on Patreon and monthly donate, give monthly donation. Uh, wherever you watch your podcast, if you could like and subscribe, share with friends, that'd be great. Father Jacob Bertrand. Father Bonaventure, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I was thinking your last name, Jancic. Yes. Polish. Yes. Okay. This is going to relate to the episode, but we're going to get there a roundabout way. Um, best, so when you were growing up, I suspect you had some great examples of people mispronouncing this in school, I suspect. What's, what did people, gener- or did you grow up in a Polish town where everyone kind of knew how to do Not, four, mm, five consonants in a row? Not really. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember, maybe because I was used to people mispronouncing yeah. the name, I don't remember there being any sort of like, uh, oh gosh, that's embarrassing kind of thing. So I'm sure it was mispronounced a lot, but I don't know. Nothing like stands out. There was no scarring kind of moment or like right. traumatic experience of it. Yeah. W- yeah. W- did you grow up in a town with a lot of Polish I don't know names if a around? lot. There was certainly, there was like a Polish, there is a St. Stanislaus is a Polish parish in town. So there's certainly a Polish contingent. My father grew up, I didn't grow up at the parish, but my father did and his family. We went to the, we grew up in the Irish Pair St. Joseph's. Oh, this is um, really going to tie into the episode, so keep. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no, I guess I guess there were enough Polish names around that it wasn't like a wholly strange phenomena. But now, but now you're up in the in the uh, you know the New England area. Correct. How do they do with Poland? Well, you're yeah yeah um, New Hampshire. How are they doing in with uh. Fine. I think people have more of a difficulty with me having a double first name, right? Than like get, a last name. So you get Father Bertrand a lot, I suspect, right? Yeah, a good bit. Okay, a good bit. But um, yeah. I mean, obviously, in in the the upper valley of New Hampshire, it's much more French Canadian, at least traditionally. Um, Ooh, so, yeah. so it's like yeah. Jacob Bertrand Jan Schulzich. That sounded zero percent French. Yeah, I don't know French um, at yeah, all. I know yeah. how to read it, uh, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. So they so. generally call you something else. Okay, that's yeah, great. Yeah, father. Yeah, that's right. That's, you know, that's that's the safe way. If you don't exactly. know how to pronounce this, this is fine. Yeah. I, Chapman, it's easy. No one really, I never got a Chapman or something like that. Like, yeah, you never get that. pretty phonetic. But Bonaventure, you get some, I remember when we were in Novitiate and we were at some conference thing, someone had put down, uh, they thought it was Brother Bonaventure. Oh, they added an R. Huh? Yeah, which is, which one, I mean, Bonaventure? It's a Catholic thing, so Braun yeah. Adventure. But then I thought like Braun Adventure could be my alter ego, the guy with the mustache, kind of you know he's a little bit uh, yeah, like a lumberjack feel to it. I think I'm thinking like Brawny Towels or something. Okay, you know, so so yeah, brother Braun Adventure, and I've gotten brother, I've gotten Bova Venture from my grandmother. She sent me one of those like, things, like bovine. Yeah, like, I think like ca- cow venture, you know, good cow or something. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, Bonaventure gets a few more than I suppose the double the double barrel name gets. Yeah. Um, why are we talking about these names? That's a great question. Because uh, the topic today is suffering, uh, and it's not suffering people mispronunciation names. But I think that we have this sense as Catholics, Irish people have this kind of guilt and that. The job of the Catholic is to suffer in life. And I thought, well, Polish people have a sense of this, but you've got both Polish and Irish roots because you grew up in an Irish parish. So- well, it was Irish traditionally. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. But we have this phrase in Catholicism we want to talk about and offering it up. And I tend you tend to associate that with Irish Catholics, I think. Maybe yeah. Italians do it as well, I suppose. No. But you tend to think of, of Irish people are the ones that, because maybe the food's bad or the, the climate's bad or something, there's this phrase... And everyone has, you know, if, if something's going wrong, offer it up. So yeah. when you grew up in your household, was this, did your mother or your father, I didn't grow up Catholic, so we, never, we didn't yeah. have this phrase, but did, did I you? I didn't grow up in like an overly pious house, so okay. no. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was, it was offered in different ways of like yeah. tough or like too bad or that right. sort of thing. But there, I, we didn't really have the pious association. I don't mean pious in a bad way, of course, right. but the, of sort of offering up your sufferings. Um, so when did you first encounter this I think uh, Really in like religious life. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Which and what, is, did, what and what did you make of it? Uh, on the one hand, like it made sense of like, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more yes. as we get into the episode. It made sense because there is a sort of um, what in, in, in 
in life and especially in in our in practicing our faith and um, a sort of detachment that we have to cultivate. Mm-hmm. Like there's there there is there is this uh, reality that there are only so many things that we can control in our lives, and mm-hmm. that and we're affected by a whole host of other things that we have no control over. So whether the difficulties in life are caused by our by our own doing or by others or whatever, um, there there is a virtuous way to react to that, mm-hmm. and there's a redemptive way to react right. to that. And I think that's part of offering it up, of yes. part of uniting our sufferings to the sufferings of Christ, and there's the redemptive power of Christ's suffering. So in that regard, um, it seemed to make sense. But because I'm, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't tend to fall in that path very often. My other, The other side of my reaction to that is is one of more falls into a more of a sort of frustrated reality in that like, well, why don't we just fix the problem? Yes. You know, kind of like. That's right. Fix it and I won't yeah. have to endure it. No, so. I think that's right. It can sound like an excuse to, you know, oh, stuff's going wrong. You know, it can the doormat feel because there's yeah. a sense in, in Christianity, we have a sense of, uh, as you mentioned, that are the redemption. That's the fact that suffering can be redemptive um, and that there is a purpose or a a power in suffering that can be turned around. I mean, ultimately, this is because of the cross and that fundamental reorientation of reality around the fact that what seemed like the worst thing in the world becomes the salvation of the world because of God's power. And then that trickles down through us in our lives in this way, and so we can participate in that, as we'll talk about in a second. But you can also use that to code over problems of, you know, my boss is just a doing bad things and treating me poorly. So, and someone says, well, I'll just, you know, offer up the sufferings. You think, well, maybe, but maybe I could just talk to him or change the situation as it is. Yeah. And some people, I think, this is a critique of Christianity in a way that it has, it can become this doormat religion or making excuses for things that it ought to change. But at a deeper level, I think people realize that some suffering is unavoidable, and I think this is where Christianity has something to offer that nothing else has to offer, in the sense that it has a, a response to suffering that doesn't deny the suffering or or think that there's a way to fight against it. We live in a world where whenever there's suffering or something to be fixed, then we we try to fix it. A lot of times in the the temporal realm, you know, so we have secular salvation narratives and climate control and all the and these are all fine, but the idea that we're going to make this the best possible world in a utopia here. You know, Christianity has this realistic, I think, sense of that there's a way in which we won't avoid all suffering, personally or otherwise, right. and yet it can't be meaningless. It can't be meaningless. And so that's, I suppose, the start point of, of this sense of redemptive suffering. But the interesting part about it is that's good. Redemptive suffering has a part for our, our lives, but the church and the Catholic tradition that's offered up ties into this fact that we can somehow participate— in the in the salvation of others by suffering and that's tied to the cross that's tied to the cross in that Christ's suffering on the cross can be shared by us because we share in the mystical body there's a biblical notion of this paul talks about this in first colossians uh, sorry colossians 124 i think where he says uh, that i i fill up the sufferings of christ in some fashion or i complete them or i make them uh, full and initially that sounds very strange, of course, but there's an element of our participation that we can share in that. So how do we, how do you, how do you get the sense of that sharing in not only suffering for your own good, in the sense of humility and this sort of aspect, but start us down the road of how we participate in Christ's salvation of other people with our suffering. What would you, what would you talk about? Yeah. There? Well, even the phrase like "offer it up" kind of begs the question of like, well, what does that, mm-hmm. what does what does that even mean? It means like, offer what are we, something yeah, up. what is it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so as we start to think about, especially like the words of St. Paul and what you're talking about now with being united to the sufferings of Christ has to do a lot with, I mean, it's fundamentally has to do with our merit, our ability yes. to merit, to win goods, um, win salvation, we could say, for ourselves or for others. Now, we want to be careful here because what we're not proposing, what St. Paul is not proposing, what this sort of idea of offering it up or like suffering well is not proposing, that we somehow by our own power are able to get ourselves to heaven or to merit things. This is not what we're saying. Yeah. It's much more a game of participation, not a game, but you know what I mean, where it's much more a thing of participation and 
cooperation, mm -hmm. um, even in the way you were pointing it, a, a participation in, 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 in the sufferings of Christ. Not that we're doing it on our own, but by grace, united to Christ, we can participate in his life. So when we say, you know, my boss is doing X and it's a real pain and it's a real burden or whatever the, the reality of suffering, if you're sick or whatever that might be, um, to offer that up, well, you're, you, what does that mean? That means mm -hmm. to um, offer that in, in this particular circumstance, offer that difficulty, that suffering for the sake of something. Yes. Um, and this in a very similar way to like praying for somebody else, right? You know, when someone says, will you pray for me? Um, and you pray for them and, and our Lord invites us to be like a real instrument, a real actor in the bringing about of that effect of what they're asking. So too with our actions. So it's not just mm -hmm. prayer, but it's also what we do in our lives. So if, you know, you can, um, perhaps with, in, in a more positive way, we can offer, you know, like even the little works we do throughout the day mm -hmm. to God or for somebody else, you know, or, but we can also do that with our sufferings, with our difficulties. Yeah. So there's, but that only exists and that's only made real, um, because it's united to Christ. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. So it, it's important. We're not, we're, we're not saying now, Jesus, you showed us how to do it. There's a sense of like, Jesus shows the pattern and then you take over and we we act in his place now because he did it for a while and actually he might have been the best one who did it, but now we kind of take over for him, but rather yeah. actually we're brought under in him by how? What, uniting our, our wills, right? I think some people have, what what are you what are you offering up? Like you're giving, you could say, well, I'm giving my suffering to God. But God doesn't need your, your you know, the negative what's causing your suffering. In fact, the suffering of itself is an evil. So ideally, you wouldn't want the suffering to be there. Right. You know, suffering is a is a result of the fall in the sense that there wouldn't be this kind of suffering uh, if if this was a perfect world. Heaven does not have suffering in the way that you kind of offer it up. But the fact that it is in this world, we have this experience of this, we offer up not the the negativity of it, but rather our attitude towards it. I mean, this is, in a sense, important part when we talk, as you say, about uniting with the cross. The Catholic notion of Christ's atonement is not so much about the fact that his suffering, qua suffering, redeemed the world, but his love and obedience to the suffering. It was his love that actually merited the treasury of God's mercy. And therefore, our suffering not qua suffering, you know, like, oh, I'm going to, I'll just add this extra, oh, this is a pain. Well, I'll just, if the more I suffer in this, the more, like, some economic exchange. But rather, see, taking this, <clears throat> this negative aspect or element of our life and saying, I accept this and will, will suffer it, I will suffer it because I love you and because you, God, have given me this and you have given me the opportunity if I see it as uniting my suffering to Christ choosing to unite his suffering for salvation, well, then it's, again, as you say, sharing with Christ's love and obedience right. that allows us. So it's it seems, in some ways, it's a simple notion, but in other ways, it's complicated to get your, your will lined up with Christ's will. When he says, not my will, but your will be done, he's offering his will to the Father. So in suffering, we're in a sense uniting our wills to his offering to the Father, and that is pleasing. That's, that is an act of love, and God will never be outdone in generosity. Therefore, that's when we talk about merit, him responding in love to our love from as, as we unite ourselves to Christ's love. Right, yeah. And I think, too, suffering and we could say using that suffering well or, like, enduring that suffering well has, um, within the, the Christian context, is, is, is kind of a unique thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because so often in, in the world, there's, there's, we do things, perhaps it's part of our fallen human nature, but we do things to sort of protect ourselves. So mm -hmm. our, we can think of the ways by which we create, create like facades of who we are, how we project ourselves, yep. or um, so, so that people think of us in a particular way, or the things we do to avoid difficulties, challenges, you know, and, and in doing in sort of that manipulation, um, we, we don't really engage fully with reality because we're always trying to uh, put forth something that's not quite the full truth or to mm -hmm. avoid this part or that part. But the beauty of, of 
of Christ and our and our faith is that it allows us to participate fully in the reality of life. Like we mm-hmm. can dive into the joys and the happiness of life because they are relative and related to God. But we can also do that on the side of things that's difficult. The, yeah. You know, we don't have to hide from the difficulties of life, and that doesn't mean that we come, somehow become like you were saying that we're looking for ways to suffer, like uh, bring it on, like make this harder, let my life be miserable. But when those inevitable inevitable difficult moments, times, however short, however long come, mm-hmm. there's an ability for the Christian to to sort of um, enter into that with yeah. some sort of, uh, with without having to hide from it. Because right. there's something, that is something, Jesus, that's that's giving this meaning in life. Yeah, there's a great, there's a, a you don't enter into something unless you feel like you can bring a good out of it. No one thinks, I'm going to enter into this uh, this project because I can destroy it. You know, that's you, well, you. You might think that, but you ought not think that, right. or something. Yeah. You you should, you only should enter into something if you think you can bring something good out of it. Now, you might not be sure how to do that or whether it's going to work, and it might not be able to bring it out. But to act, you should act towards the good. And Christianity allows this because of Christ's redemption on the cross, because He has a way of changing suffering into good, the greater good. Um, this is the Easter vigil, O Felix culpa. That's such a great suff- that such a great redemption would come from this. Um, we can, in the same way. Enter in, take suffering and say, I'm going to enter into this. I'm going to lean into this a little bit. Nonsense of demanding more of it, but accept, as you say, the reality of it, not ignoring it. People run away from suffering, not in the sense of avoiding it as you often ought to, of course, but in the sense of avoiding that it's happening, denying that it's occurring, and not embracing the reality to then say, well, even I this reality, this negative reality, I can take and go forward with it and offer it for something. Now, I think the, although it sounds crazy to think of offering suffering as a positive act, anyone who knows what love is knows that it involves a sort of suffering, a subjugating of your will to the will of the, of the other. And if that's a finite will and a fallen will, that might mean actually suffering for your will. St. Faustina talks says that in one passage, that suffering is the thermometer of one's love. It's the measuring of how much you actually love someone, whether you're willing to actually suffer. Because if you don't suffer for someone, I mean, do you really, do you really love them, or do you really love yourself and what they do for you? I think parents know this, essentially, of course, is that having a child, and when you love that child, you suffer, you change, you want to conform that child to you and assist that child, but there are many times where you have to suffer, you know, I mean, this is the the sor- mother mother of sorrows. This kind of this suffering that can be used for this. So that suffering has a redemptive aspect, and that it's tied to love is not unintelligible. And I think there's a deeper truth about that, not just theologically, but even phenomenologically. You could say, yeah. And this we get in the first letter of Saint John, right? By this we know what love is. That he laid down his love his life for us, and we should lay down our lives for our brethren. Yeah. Um, it's identified, you know, Christ's suffering and charity are identified together. Um, as you said, that that's no accident. And I don't think, and I think this is, we've been talking about this a bit, but to say it explicitly, I don't think we can understand properly this notion of suffering, this notion of offering it up, of being united to Christ, but for charity, mm-hmm. but for love. I mean, this is yeah. why Christ died on the cross, as, as you've already said, but for us too, even to offer it up, offer up our sufferings for even ourselves mm-hmm. or somebody else. Yes. That's really, I mean, it's not selfish to do that for yourself. I mm-hmm. mean, we're, we're called to love ourselves well, you know, right? That's But to do that for somebody else, that, that self-emptying reality of charity really defines what it means to be, um, to be a lover and loved in that kind of way and to live in charity. So to, to sort of think of offering up our sufferings as just a sort of like, like um like stoic test of like mm-hmm. can I do this well yes. th- we're missing the point yeah. we're missing the whole point in fact um this is really about loving and like living in the reality of the world in which we live which is also where God is and where he offers his grace and loving in that reality you know our right. our lord ourselves and others yes and because the the so when we use the analogy the national analogy of parents that when you suffer for your child in a way that's very direct and you you see the example of what that means the yeah. love of the child and the forgiveness and the mercy of the child but the what here we have a deeper vision because God is in charge of the world and because He's working His grace in all times and all places and because He loves to do that through our our reciprocal relationships in the sense our grace relationship with Him 
even if the suffering isn't directly related to something in front of us, I can't figure out what the suffering is for, you could say. I can unite that to God for some good, especially when we think of the souls in purgatory, right? So that this we can offer up our sufferings for the, to merit, not because of our own merit, but because we are seeing ourselves as shared in the story of Christ's merit, and therefore God responding generously and using our suffering for the good of others that we might not even know about. But let's talk about then concretely, so as we kind of shift here to the end of the episode, um, we've given you some a, a biblical background for this thing. We've talked a little about what it means to suffer and the, the richness of that, and especially in the Christian tradition. Uh, also, some avoiding some temptations to think that it's we should just desire it. So we're avoiding, the, we could say, the Irish temptation um, that just obviously qua suffering it's good. Um, but now back to the practice of it. Um, what are some recommendations? You know, you're a pastor. You have care mm. of souls. So uh, how how can we? How do we? Offer it up. How do you? How do we do this? And what are some examples you could say? I've got some thoughts, but what do you? Yeah. What would you say about from the, in the in the daily life of a, of a Catholic and a Christian? Um, how how they can do this? How can you intend, intend this and all of that different ways? Yeah, I mentioned it a bit, um, or I mentioned what I'm going mm-hmm. to mention again a little bit earlier. Yeah. And that's that's that our, I guess I could say it this way that you know the Lord doesn't want just part of our lives. He doesn't want us just for time. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want just this or that. He he wants the totality of our lives. Our Lord wants to like invade everything that we are and fill that with his, with his divine life, with his grace, with his love. And that means that all that we do Mm -hmm. ought to be united to, oriented to God. Now that doesn't mean that like when we watch like a football game on Sunday or something, we have to also be praying the rose. Like we can, it's, it's, it's still human life. Uh, human living, but but all of it can can and should be redeemed by God's grace. Can contribute to our to our growth and holiness. So even the good things that we do, you know, like we can we can pray for somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, we can offer actions for say, I'm going to offer this rosary. I'm going to have a mass said for somebody. I'm going to um, as a parent, even like you know, you use the example of parents. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to getting up in the middle of the night to change a diaper mm-hmm. and feed a baby. Like this can be, you know, we do this not we, I don't have children, but parents do this Mm -hmm. out of charity. And, you know, this is something that sanctifies. And we can do the same with our suffering, um, with the difficulties. Well, I know that, what, I'm somebody who's sick, by way of example, I'm going to offer this for the Mm -hmm. sake of my other friend who's suffering. You know, I'm going to endure this and and give this through grace, through charity, meaning that's otherwise, you know, that, that is, that is redemptive by by participating and cooperating with the grace that God gives. I guess my point here is is not that we have to like not that offering it up or living the Christian life is something complicated or something yeah. extra. It doesn't change mm-hmm. the sort of circumstances of life necessarily, but it changes or ought to change the way we engage with the yes. circumstances of life. Oh. So it's kind of a rethinking of yep. okay, I'm doing X, Y, Z today, and some of that might be good, some of it might be bad, some of it might be enduring, not sin bad, but like difficult, some yes. of it might, might, might be enduring suffering. How can I mm-hmm. offer and give all of that? Yes. No, I think that's your, your absolute, so it, the Christian life may not necessarily be a changing of any given activity you're doing, but your intentionality in, in how you're doing that, what you're, how you're viewing that, how you're intending... We are spiritual creatures, we're not just material creatures, so how we engage in something, how we frame it, not just a sense of a narrative, but actually what our intentions are. Right. You know, I can I can do the same action from the outside, you might not be able to tell whether it's an act of charity or whether it's an act of malice, but I know, or I ought to know, and God knows, because I have the spiritual intention involved in that that shapes what the bodily actions are. Um, and... We're, we therefore it's one part dangerous, one part uh, beautiful. Dangerous in that we can live our entire life, as you say, um, committed to God, intending God in all sorts of little ways and and large ways. Uh, that's the the danger, of course, is that when we don't do this, and then we can get just caught caught up in in our own self and intending everything just for our good, as opposed to Him. But the beauty is that. As you say, we can bring everything under the command of Christ. We can bring everything as an acceptance of his will in my day, including suffering. I think what this means practically is 
the very natural experience of suffering, if something goes wrong, something, you know, you, you, you miss something, or someone mistreats you, or there's some misunderstanding, or what have you, any kind of suffering, or even physical suffering or illness, when you see the saints, Faustine, of course, lives through massive physical suffering, you could just become pitying and woe is me. And that's the natural kind of reaction. Yeah. But to train yourself to have a habit of, an, of, of saying, yes, this is not good, but because Christ suffered and offered his will to the Father, I offer my suffering here and the subjugation of my will because I wouldn't want to do this right now, but I trust and in providence and I accept this and I offer my will, my love to God in accepting this, that he might love someone else with this gift. So it's offering a gift of your will, your obedience, and your love to him that he might use that in what's called the treasury of merit for another soul or for, or even for your own. And I think it's a practice that you have to have in your head, but then you have to have in your will. And some sufferings are, are easier offered up than others, but the witness of reading the lives of the saints, especially the suffering saints, you could say, helps to give you some models. And you think, oh gosh, well, if they could offer that suffering up, you know, I can offer mine. But it starts small, you know. It's, yeah. But And I think it nat- it's just a natural reaction, of course, that suffering is not desirable, but we can make it acceptable to our Father as a fragrant offering, this sort of thing, as the way that Christ does. Right. Yeah, and I think the last thing, at least, that I'll say mm-hmm. in, in all of this is that the it's like even the phrase offering it up is, is an active thing rather than a passive thing. You know, often mm-hmm. suffering, we mm-hmm. kind of, there's kind of passivity in suffering. Things sure. happen to Naturally. us. Yeah. Um, but with this, we be we sort of take an active role. It's something, we've, we've said this, but um, it's our decision, you know, using our will, our choice to cooperate with um, the graces that are given in difficult moments, you know, because our Lord, our Lord is present. You know, he offers himself in those moments. So it's like you were saying, our offering of our will, our offering of our obedience, our offering of love in these moments. But that's also something that that we do. So it's, 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 there's a real sort of, um, the agency and yeah, redemption agency in it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's, and that's, that's a good point for a spiritual, uh, warfare in a sense. We haven't brought in the Satan on this, but Satan would love nothing more than us to just suffer and suffer and suffer. And that's what hell is, right? It's just yeah. constant suffering with no agency in our part that we just, we just receive in this. Uh, whereas s- offering it up is a first step at least. And it is the step when you unite with Christ to turning evil into some sort of good, so that you can say to Satan and all evil, um, yes, this is occurring, but because of Christ, uh, I have power over this. It's to take back, in a sense, through Christ, by uniting with the suffering, some agency for right. the good. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, We'll end on that point, um, and we'll end the suffering of our listeners, perhaps. But maybe it's redemptive. We hope it is. Uh, if you like uh, God's planning, if this was helpful, please share it with those who uh, you might know, anyone who might be suffering or struggling in some in some way. Uh, if you would go onto our well, any of the podcast apps you listen to, like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. Those are very helpful. Leave comments as well. If you have comments, those are helpful for us to know about things, about how we're doing and what you would like to hear, or if something was particularly uh, uh, helpful, or just prayers for those in the in the, our God's Pointing community. If you'd like to join and to support the podcast, we have on Patreon, you can become a patron, give monthly donations, whatever you'd like to do, it's very helpful to us. And we use that money to both uh, upgrade technology stuff, but also to support the retreats and things, which you'll hear more about uh, coming up for those who are going. Um, So also, if you go in the show notes, you'll see merchandise information. You can go onto our website. We have information about upcoming events. Uh, Please check in and look at those things. So we'll be praying for you. Please pray for us, and we'll catch you next time on God's Planning. Mm-hmm.